Hello everyone, welcome to Psychology Today. I'm your host, Monica Vacherez, and thank you for watching. Our show is about bicycling in general and specifically about bicycle safety. I hope Psychology Today inspires you to ride a bike and helps you be more mindful of safety. We try to celebrate those in our community that incorporate bicycling into their career choices and or strive to encourage others to ride and support cycling and bike safety. So before we meet our guests, I want to thank our very capable crew behind the scenes, Chris, Casey, and Bruce. Thank you guys. And also thanks to our producer, Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. The Northwest Bicycle Safety Council is working on our 2018 season of events where we will provide helmets for local cyclists who need one. It's also very important that you have your helmet properly fitted so that it can do its job. Our first event will be July the 14th. It's called the Rosewood Rock Walkways. And we're gonna be working with Bikes for Humanity and putting on a family ride. So I hope you'll join us. And we'll be discussing that more with our first guests. So we're gonna have two guests on the show. The first segment will be with Andrew Shaw Kitch. He's with Bikes for Humanity. We'll learn about that organization and how they're helping people in our community. Then we'll meet Maddie Carlson, author and columnist with bikeportland.org. We'll talk about her perspectives, including riding with children. So let's get started. Our first guest is Andrew Shaw Kitch, representing Bikes for Humanity. Welcome to Psychology Today, Andrew, and thanks for joining me. Thank you, Monica. It's a pleasure to be here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Andrew, family, career, how you came to be in the Portland area? Sure. Uh, I came to Portland in 2005 to go to Lewis and Clark College. Um, I've always identified as um, a lover of books and reading, so Portland was a natural choice, and I came to study literature at Lewis and Clark, and I came to find that there's so much more that Portland has to offer and that I can um, center myself on and kind of um, do and it involved the walkability of the city, the ability to ride a bike safely, the way that transit is integrated in the city, and I just fell in love with that and how an individual can um, participate and not have to, to use a car to do so. Um, I ended up uh, graduating and then moving back to Monterey County where I grew up for a few years and then missing Portland and then coming back and diving into kind of the bike scene and um, learning how to be a mechanic and ultimately um, uh, more or less helping run Bikes Humanity as an instructor, a mechanic, and kind of a lot of work that I've done as a teacher in my past. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've found a really great fit with the organization. I love the work that we do. Um, I live in Southeast Portland and so um, I have a really kind of bike-centric life where I'm able to ride my bike to, to work um, at 33rd and Powell and do our other programs, which are often bike rides or um, riding with our tools to set up um, mobile repair stands. And yeah, I think that's... Um, nice intro. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of went into my next question, but that's sure. okay, I'm gonna ask you anyway. So what's your own cycling history and how does the bike fit into your lifestyle right now? Uh, sure, so I grew up um, in kind of a rural area between Monterey and Salinas and there was lots of Bureau of Land Management um, area, so it was the former Ford Ord. So I grew up riding a 20 inch uh, red BMX Mongoose and just falling in love with get going out and being able to cover miles and miles of terrain oh. with my brother and, and friends in the neighborhood and then come back and um, be able to ride the bike to school. And um, it was actually, I didn't even realize that somebody would need a lock living in this kind of rural area until in like seventh grade, uh, my bicycle was stolen. And there wasn't the kind of the infrastructure or the culture to say like, oh, that's terrible. You need another right. bike or anything. Right. I had stopped being a child. Right. And so I lost track of the bike until maybe, I think I was 17. And I'd already had like a part-time job at the movie theater as like a teenager. And the first thing I bought was I went to Costco and got a Motive smoothie with <laughs> my earnings from the movie theater. And then learned how to put the bike on the bike rack and be able to take it into town and kind of make my way around Monterey or Salinas and um, feel the kind of self-sufficiency that you get driving a car. Right. But being able to have the freedom to not have to worry about 
paying for gas or, or maintenance or having to check in with my parents if I can borrow the car <laughs> or whatnot. Um, but then coming to Portland, I brought my motive smoothie and felt like very out of, um, kind of out of the, the hip bike scene with oh. my like 26 inch with big, big, big tires and like full suspension, silly like Costco bike. Right. Um, and then ended up um, getting like a road bike and then getting used to that. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved back to Monterey that I had my first experience getting a used bike and learning how to refurbish it myself oh. and turn something that I got for $15 at an estate sale into this beautiful like commuting machine that I was able to take bike camping and outfit with front and rear racks. And that was, um, uh, I think, a 1990 Miata Triple Cross, Ooh. which was a, a beautiful bike. And I learned later that they um, the, the company started in the 1890s as a rifle manufacturer, and they were able to get the tubing for bicycles so perfect because they had decade, for decades made the tubing for rifles. Right. And so it's the, to me, it became this beautiful metaphor of something violent that's turned into this kind of peaceful machine <laughs> with the same technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's a, that's a metaphor that I carry forward with bicycles in general that um, th you're able to, to take take something and then use it as a vehicle for peace and, and kind of community building. Um, not to get too down on cars, but um, the bicycle is a good, is that kind of um, um, alternative to um, something that is based on explosions and taking tiny explosions in an engine and then turning that into the momentum. Um, yeah. How did you find the bike? Um, it was uh, not an estate sale. It was a um, a silent auction. So they had in Pacific Grove, which is a, a town that has a lot of older wealth um, on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, they had a monthly auction upstairs. There was the the regular one, and then downstairs it was like um, boxes of records and old furniture, and then you just sign in mm. um, your price. And I think it had, it had deflated tires, oh. and it just didn't look very attractive. It was very dusty. And so I was able to put my $15 bid in, and nobody else uh, went on it. $15, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. OK, so Northwest Bicycle Safety Council is a partner with Bike for Humanities at times, and we are like-minded in many ways. Can you just explain the overall mission of Bikes for Humanity and what drew you personally to it? So the overall mission is to provide um, access to safe and affordable bikes uh, to folks um, in general. So if you are uh, somebody of means and you want to um, invest in a safe um, bike and affordable to you is a $300 nice old Cannondale that we fixed up or somebody that doesn't have any means and mm -hmm. um, is able to um, either pitch in around the shop, um, learn how to be a mechanic and fix bikes and do a work trade so you can walk away adopting a bike without any cost to you. Um, so that in that mission of um, providing safe and affordable bikes to the community, we're also taking bikes that aren't being used, we call them underutilized, and otherwise are on their way to eventually going to the dump or just mm -hmm. being left in garages for another decade or so and turning those into working machines that people can incorporate into their mm. daily lives. Um, and th through that as well, we're able to provide mechanic education to folks that want to participate in our mission. Um, and that can help them become their own self-sufficient um, commuters and that they're able to maintain their own bike. Um, and that also through that process gets bikes fixed. Oh, okay. And these, these uh, kind of general mechanic skills, um, as somebody learns, they become the holder of that. And they can pass on those skills to, to more folks. And um, I think historically there used to be, you know, some in a neighborhood there was somebody on the block that was known as the person that could fix your bike and mm -hmm. everybody could go there. And so we're just trying to c keep that tradition alive and um, creating um, both a bike shop and a school where folks can um, gain those skills and then also if they want to contribute and pass those skills on, come and, and share them with other folks. And what drew you to Bikes for Humanity? Um, when I moved back to Portland, I had kind of caught the bug of um, learning how to work on bikes and um, knew that I enjoyed it and also n knew that there was a lot more for me to learn, um, especially for maintaining my own bike. Um, I was um, working as a writer and kind of also working um, 
in a, in a kitchen as a dishwasher, so I was trying to make ends meet and trying to figure out what to do. Um, and uh, a $60 repair would be a big deal for me. And so being able to uh, find a place where I could learn the skills myself um, was, was very helpful and appealing to me. And then mm. I fell in love with the organization, the whole mission, um, through doing the Thursday Night Mechanics class. And through there was recruited to be on the board of the, the steering committee. Um, at that time, we weren't quite a 501c3, so we had a steering committee instead of an actual board. Mm. Um, so through that leadership and then also taking on, um, with my kind of writing background, um, communications and social media, what we called team promotions at the time, and was able to build mechanic skills that way and contribute and, um, yeah, be, be essentially what we tried to, to create, which was a self-sufficient bike commuter. I think when I retire, I want to be a bike mechanic. I spend so much money. I think I'm contributing to my mechanic's college <laughs> fund for both of his kids. Right. I spend so much money on mechanical work. Well, I'm sure he appreciates oh. it. <laughs> <I Yeah. know. laughs> okay, so what role do you play at Bikes for Humanity? Um, so coming from that kind of background where I was um, uh, on, on the steering committee, and then um, in 2015, we got our 501c3, so then the steering committee became the board. Mm. So learning how to, to run the organization from leadership and also from promotion, um, uh, was able to kind of oversee a transition where the founder, Stephen Kung, uh, left to do his own kind of bike adventures. He had put in a decade founding the organization and putting all the pieces in place for it mm. to be sustainable. Mm but was ready to enjoy his retirement mm -hmm. and to go on all the <laughs> bike adventures um, that he wanted to do after creating the means for all right. these other folks. So mm -hmm. kind of overseeing that transition um, taught me all the things that needed to be done over the next three years of how the organization has run as I was learning to become a mechanic and find my role as um, a mechanic instructor as well. Okay. Um, so at this point I help uh, run, run the space on PAL and um, coordinate the uh, chain reaction program that we do at Central State Concern downtown, and then um, the bike hub in Gresham, and then all of the, the kind of associated um, mechanics workshops that we do. Nice. So you recently moved your shop to the 33rd and Powell location? We were, um, we moved right next door. So oh. we were in the corner space um, at 33rd Place in Powell that was next to Bingo Books. So it was um, in terms of the building's history, it was added on in like the 60s, 70s and was a call center. At one point it was a um, emporium of like toddle, used toddler clothes. Oh. Um, and then we moved in four years ago and bu uh, built it out. But it was when I started coming there um, three and a half, so the fall of 2014, um, it was just bikes everywhere, just piled on top of each other. Mm. And then um, portable, um, bike stands up and, and tools everywhere and kind of boxes it at different parts. Mm. And if somebody brought in donations, they would just be kind of tucked away in the corner. And so it was um, turning that into a workable community space was a long process. And in that process, we got storage in the basement below and invited another organization to open up a, a coffee shop and kind Ooh, of exciting. have that synergy. Yeah. Um, but we were able to um, expand into a, a part of the bingo books and allow them to build their own bike shop oh. um, in the back there for their um, their programs, which involve helping um, youth experiencing homelessness transition and get their job skills. So they have a barista program there and then a mechanic program, and they're also <gasps> taking in bikes and getting them fixed. And back so out tell us exactly where you're located so we can come get coffee and contribute right. to you. So we're <laughs> at 3366 Powell. Okay. Um, in inside of Bingo Books, and then our our uh, partner neighbors are at three three five four. So okay. on the south side of Powell at thirty third place. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a little hub of exciting projects, and there's there's a motorcycle shop in the same building, and then Bingo Books, if you haven't been there, yeah. is an amazing used bookstore. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's 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 not it's not Powell's with all kind of the flashy organization and all that. It's very much. Um, people bring in books, they get quickly sorted, and you have to kind of weave your way through the, the labyrinth of shelves to find what you want. Well, with your literature background, I'll come talk to you first. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and go and get the books. Yeah, it's, I've kind of, uh, my dream of working in a bookstore has kind of come around in this yeah. kind of backwards way. You get to do both things. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
So let's get into more specifics about Bikes for Humanity and the many elements that you all do. I have down, first of all, bike donation and adoption. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So um, we are a space where folks can donate a bike uh, knowing that the value of that bike um, will be increased. You know, you could leave your bike outside and there's cross your fingers that somebody's going to take it and fix whatever needs to be fixed and find um, an owner for it. And so the, what, we, what we provide is the same way that the Humane Society would provide for, for pets, is that you can drop off um, something you can't care for that y is not uh, sustainable or useful in your life anymore, and we will take it and we will rehabilitate it and we will mm -hmm. find somebody that will look after it. Okay, so then there's an adoption process where you get the pet or bike adopted. Right. yes. <laughs> so under that umbrella of adoption, we have um, folks that can just outright buy a bicycle, um, can do a work trade, or through various partners, we can find folks who adopt bikes, uh, whether it's from um, shelters, where mm -hmm. um, folks will, will come in saying, we're, we're struggling, our kid needs a bike, um, or through um, work rehabilitation programs, somebody just got a job, and what the only thing holding them back is, is a means to get there. Um, and then through bike safety education programs throughout the city, um, we have provided graduates of fourth and fifth grade safe routes to school bike safety, um, helmets, locks, well, no Northwest Bicycle Safety Council provides the helmets, um, and so we provide locks and the bicycles, and um, following up on the bike safety skills that they've learned through the, the program in schools. So happy to hear that. So number two, volunteer mechanic workshops. Describe some of the curriculum and current issues regarding an instructor. So uh, yeah, Thursday night we have our mechanics workshop, which goes through eight different um, kind of subjects um, on what, what to, to do on a bike. So um, one will, the first one will be hubs, and we'll kind of look at how to open up and clean up and inspect for damage a hub, and then repack it with grease. And then the next week will be another bearing system. And so we'll go through eight different subjects, and so somebody can piece together a kind of full mechanics education by showing up every Thursday night. And we're doing two in Gresham uh, each month, so Wednesday nights from 6 to 8, the first and third Wednesday. We're doing those, and then that same kind of broad curriculum is what we do every Tuesday at Chain Reaction at um, Central City Concerns Estate Hotel. Nice. Um, but so th for a long time, the um, Chris Nelson, who was an amazing instructor and has been a mechanic for decades, ran the program and kind of built the scaffolding for the um, the what was before the multi mechanics class, which mm -hmm. is what I went through. Um, that was um, 90 minutes lecture, 90 minutes hand hands on, so a full three hours. Um, so since he left about a year ago to move to Seattle with his uh, wife and, and child. Um, we kind of scrambled to figure out what to do, and um, my style of, of instructing is more to give folks the kind of the basis for what they need to know to start off with the hands-on portion. So the, the workshop is just two hours and it incorporates um, theory and hands-on at the same time and is on a smaller scale. So we, we usually have three to six students at a time as opposed to around ten when, when Chris was doing it. Oh, I see. I bet that would be easier to learn with less, get more attention that way. Sure, yeah, definitely. And also for, for my own style, I don't have decades working in the bike industry. I just started working on my own bike, you know, five or six years ago. Mm. So having 90 minutes of lecture to talk about the history of, <laughs> the, you know, the hub is not mm -hmm. something that I can, I can really approach. Right. So what I have down partnership with Gresham this summer. Right, so that is, um, uh, a space that um, is in the, the barn at Main City Park where they have most of their landscaping okay. uh, materials for all of the park system in Gresham. So we have a little room. We're able to put donated bikes and our tools and stands and a little canopy so that um, twice a month, the first and third Wednesdays, we can bring it out and then do free repairs in the park wow. and also accept donations and provide uh, mechanics education. So is that right where you come off, you know they have that spring water corridor trail that exactly. people can bike on, mm -hmm. and there's like a baseball diamond, and you can, that's where the Portland wheelmen come and go to Jazzy Bagel. Oh, is okay. that where? Yeah, yeah, okay. so exactly. So um, Main, Main Street is where Jazzy Bagel is with uh, Powell, 
and then it becomes kind of the parking lot for Main City Park and then hits the Springwater Corridor with that big new sign that they have with the metal benches built yes, into I it. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. so we had some uh, grand opening celebrations in May um, right where that big sign is to get lots, lots of attention from folks riding the spring water to let them know that we're going to be there. Um, but the, yeah, the idea is to, um, as school lets out, to be a resource for kids that are looking for something to do and might have a flat tire. Um, and then at the same time, a space where folks can, can volunteer um, or earn a bike. A lot of, a lot of our volunteers that come from Gresham and, th and go all the way to 33rd and Powell. And so it makes uh, has made sense to us to go out and mm. bring those resources there. Cause they, there's only one bike shop in Gresham right now. I didn't realize that. Uh, the, yeah, they do amazing things and they definitely do a lot of work. But you know, f compared to the amount of bike shops in in Portland or even in a square mile of central Portland, it's a it's a tall order for one bike shop to fill all those oh, needs. I'm so glad you're out there, and that's a perfect spot for you to be right by that bike trail. What about helmets? So that is, that is something that we cannot fix. If, uh, if we get a used donation of a helmet, there's a, there's a lifespan, um, three to five years, mm -hmm. that a helmet is good for, whether it's just light or kind of the incidental dropping, mm -hmm. all the, the styrofoam kind of breaks down. And so as an organization that tries to reuse as much as possible, helmets is one spot where we can't. Um, and so we're immensely grateful to the Northwest Bicycle Safety Council for providing us with helmets for um, as long as I've been with Bikes Humanity, which is four years. Mm -hmm. And particularly the Safe Routes to School bike grants that we've done, um, it's basically irresponsible to give a bike to somebody that is um, any age, but specifically a child. And not without a helmet. Exactly. Right. So um, through, through the bike gra grants to Safe Routes to School kids, um, uh, we've been able to grant 200 helmets along with those oh, nice. and then set up a kid with the full um, helmet lock um, bell is something we've added in there too mm -hmm. um, so that they can commute and, and be safe. And um, have fun. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> can you share some anecdotal stories about individuals who have benefited from Bikes for Humanity? Um, totally, yeah. I mean, they're the the kind of the universality of the bike it's just it's the intersection of so many different experiences um, for anybody that um, from from a child to somebody that has um, mobility issues as as an older adult um, the bicycle can be immensely helpful to them so we have um, folks that come by and they what they do is they are they have like a small commute but walking is too much. Um, the bus is too expensive, so they we set them up with a free bicycle that um, can get them at five miles an hour on the sidewalk where they need to go without putting um, stress on, on on their backs or on their hips. Um, yeah, so it's been for, there have been people at Chain Reaction that have benefited that just say that walking is too hard because of hip surgeries mm -hmm. and have been able to build up their own bicycle. Um, we've been doing 25 or so bikes a year through Chain Reaction. Um, for the last three years, so every one of those folks is is an is a unique story. Mm -hmm. Whether they're using the bike to to deal with with recovery and something they can focus on that's positive and 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 manageable that mm -hmm. gives them something to be proud of and a healthy way to put out their energy, or um, folks with mobility issues, or folks needing to to get to a a, a night shift. The, in St. John's, we had one person that. Um, was transitioning out of homelessness through Central City Concern and got a job at St. John's that started at, um, I think it was like 9 p.m. and then he gets off at like 5 a.m. and the mm. buses don't run. And so he was able to incorporate the bicycle and, and ride his bike up there. Um, and get some exercise. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, and then there were like great little stories. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody came in, he was riding a bike that had no brakes. So he was what we call Fred Flintstoning it, where he just oh, put yeah. your feet down to slow down. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we can't generally can't just stop everything to help somebody with a free repair and free parts. Um, so we were able to, um, it was the, the brake workshop, so we were able to um, use his bike as an example of how to install brakes and um, set him up. Um, and that kind of free repair was able to serve the students, serve the organization doing its mission, and give this guy working brakes on his bike. It's all meant to be. Exactly, yeah. So what are Bike for Humanity's long-range goals? 
Um, our long range goals are just to, to continue what we're doing and okay. make it more sustainable. Um, there are always going to be every spring cleaning, dozens and dozens of bikes that people need to, to be repurposed and there's going to be dozens and dozens of people that need bikes that can't afford them otherwise and lots of members of our community that want a, a, a means to better themselves as they give back to the community. I definitely want to talk about how we at your community can contribute to your mission, but I don't want to leave you without talking about our ride coming up on July 14th. Oh, right. The Rosewood Rockways and the family ride. So can you touch on that before we go into how we can help you? Totally, yeah. So uh, July 14th, um, out at the Rosewood Initiative, um, Oregon Walks is partnering with them and with us and a whole bunch of other organizations and the Northwest Bicycle Safety Council as well to um, close off part of 162nd which is a big four, -way, four lane throughway and making it a parade route and so we'll be um, pr providing um, helmets and then ride leadership and um, just showing kids in the neighborhood that the, the street is for them to, to enjoy um, and that there is you know, there is a place for walking and riding, even if it feels unsafe, that there's movement to, to make um, safe, safe routes um, for the neighborhood mm. and to come together and, and uh, make it happen. Yeah, so we're looking forward to that on July 14th, the Rosewood Walkways at 162nd and... And Stark. Stark. Yes. Okay. And then, how can we help your mission? How can the community come together and help you? Um, so folks can participate in lots of ways, whether it's donating bikes or monetary donations, um, or participating at the Waterfront Blues Festival um, bike corrals that we run. Um, volunteers get free admittance to the, uh, the Blues Fest and a shirt, and all they have to do is sit and watch bikes and smile and, and be friendly. <laughs> um, and it's a big fundraiser for us every year, but it's uh, Wednesday, July 4th through uh, Saturday. So. And we get to hear the wonderful blues music playing in Waterfront Park. Exactly, yeah. So where are the seats? Where's the bike corral? Uh, <laughs> we have two. There's one on NATO, and then there's one right by the Salmon Street uh, Fountain by the Hawthorne Bridge. So we provide um, two, two spots for bike parking for folks that come. And it's always lots and lots of bikes, and it's always a great time. So you can go to uh, b4hpdx.org slash volunteer, and there will be info on how to sign up as a volunteer. Okay, so let's do that slowly for us older people. Sure. B, B for H. PDX, so B4HPDX.org slash okay. volunteer. And that's where we can sign up to volunteer or donate financially the or bikes and find out more information about Bikes for Humanity. Exactly, yes. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, Andrew. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. We'll be seeing you later this summer at the Rosewood Walkways Family Ride. We're going to go to a safety video and return with our second guest and discuss family writing. So please stay with me. I'll be right back with Maddie Carlson, author and columnist at bikeportland.org. We have a brief safety video, and then we'll be back with the amazing Miss M. Great. Let's Every day, more and more people are discovering the benefits of bicycling. It's healthy, relaxing, and fun. It's great exercise and something everyone can enjoy. Millions of Americans are saving money, reducing pollution, and easing congestion every day by simply riding to work, to the store, or to visit friends. more and more people are discovering the benefits of bicycling. It's healthy, relaxing, and fun. It's great exercise and something everyone can enjoy. Millions of Americans are saving money, reducing pollution, and easing congestion every day by simply riding to work, to the store, or to visit friends and family. 
Whether you are riding for the first time since childhood or you ride often, following a few simple pointers can make your ride safe and enjoyable. Hi, I'm Celine Yeager. You know that old saying, you never forget how to ride a bike? Well, it turns out that's only partly true. Sure, you can get on your bike and pedal, but do you really know how to drive your bike in today's traffic? Yes, I said drive your bicycle. You see, riding a bicycle is very similar to driving a car. The same rules of the road apply to both. In many states, bicycles are considered vehicles, so bicyclists have the same responsibilities and rights as motorists. Here are some tips for safe riding. First, let's make sure you have a bike that fits you properly. Bikes these days come in a wide variety of styles and prices. Talk with the staff of your local bike shop about the kind of riding you'll do and choose the right bike for you. Hybrid and comfort bikes are great for everyday riding around town. Sport, touring, and racing bikes are better for longer rides. If you are riding off-road, head for the mountain bike section of the store for bikes with fatter tires and gearing better suited to unpaved trails. Getting a bike that fits makes it easier and safer to handle and much more enjoyable to ride. Make sure there's an inch or two between you and the top tube on a road bike. And on a mountain bike, you want the clearance to be more like five inches to make it easier and safer to get off the bike on rough terrain. Adjust your seat height so there's a slight bend in your knee when your foot is on the pedal in the downmost position. There are three pieces of equipment that you will need to stay safe. First, a bicycle helmet. You need to wear a bicycle helmet regardless of your skill level or reasons for riding. It is the single most important piece of safety equipment you can use. It significantly reduces your chance of head injury if you crash. Be safe and be a role model for other bicyclists. Wear a properly fitted helmet each time you ride. A properly fitted helmet should be comfortably snug. It shouldn't shake, and it should sit on your forehead about two fingers width between the brim and your brows. Your helmet should sit level on your head, and then make sure that the sliders meet in a V under your earlobes. Chin straps should be snug under your chin, with room to breathe, of course. Second, if you are riding at night or in low light conditions, you need lights and reflectors. Every state requires bicyclists to have a white front light and a red light or reflector on the back of their bike. Third, you want to be seen and recognized by motorists at any time of day or night. So wear bright clothing with reflective tape or markings. And now one more thing before you set off. You don't want your bike to fail you. So get in the habit of doing the ABC quick check before you ride. A is for air. Check that your tires are properly inflated. They should be pumped up to the inflation rating printed on the tire. Many bicycle pumps come with a pressure gauge, so you can make sure they're properly inflated. Low pressure tires can easily puncture. B is for brakes. Check that your brakes are working. Your brake lever shouldn't come closer than a thumb's width to the handlebar. Your wheel should spin freely when the brakes are off. C is for the cranks, chain, and cassette. Grab both crank arms like this and wiggle them to make sure they aren't loose. Spin the pedals and make sure the chain runs smoothly through the gears. Quick means making sure your wheels are on tight if you have quick release wheels. The wheels should be snug in the dropouts and the quick release lever fastened tight. Finally, check to make sure nothing else is loose on your bike. If there's anything you can't fix, take your bike to your local bike shop and get a professional to help you. Now we're ready to ride. Remember, bicyclists have the same responsibilities and rights as motor vehicle operators, so we follow the same rules of the road. Here are some important rules to remember. Ride in the same direction as traffic. Bicyclists riding the wrong way can cause a crash for two reasons. Turning motorists, in particular, are not looking for you there, and you can't see and follow the traffic signs or signals if you're heading the wrong way. Obey all traffic signs, signals, and road markings. This means stopping at stop signs and red lights and yielding to crossing pedestrians. It also means riding in turn lanes when you turn and straight lanes if you're going straight. Ride defensively. Look before riding out of driveways. Always look for turning vehicles and pedestrians in your path. Look behind you before changing lanes. Know the law. Laws differ in each state or jurisdiction. In some areas, it's illegal to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk. If you must ride on the sidewalk, look for turning or crossing vehicles at driveways and intersections. Every community has different rules and regulations for driving a bicycle. Know those that apply to you, obey them, and set a good example for others. Avoid road hazards. Carefully ride around drain grates, gravel, glass, and debris. 
be predictable. Help motorists know exactly what you plan to do. Signal, make eye contact if you can, and ride without swerving. Signaling and checking behind you while riding straight takes practice. So working on these skills in a vacant lot is a smart idea. Stay to the right and pass on the left. This applies to the road and riding on a shared use path or trail. On a path, give an audible signal and always yield to pedestrians and people on horseback. When trails cross roadways, use caution and obey any traffic signs and signals. Bicycling is fun, but it requires all your concentration. It requires using a helmet, lights, and bright colored clothing, and a bicycle in good repair that's properly fit to you. It requires you follow the traffic principles and be prepared to avoid hazards. This film was produced by the League of American Bicyclists with the support of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I'm Celine Yeager. Ride safe! Welcome back. I'm Monica Vashrez, your host for Psychology Today. And we, before we start our discussion with our next guest, the Divine Miss M, I want to encourage you cyclists to look into the future and try one of more of the very many event rides that are coming up. So the Gorge Rides this Saturday is June the 16th. It's put on by the Friends of the Historic Columbia River Highway. It's always a crowd pleaser with spectacular scenery. It starts in the Dalles at the Discovery Museum. And it goes over to Hood River, up Arena Crest, down to the bike trail, which is four miles of a protected bike trail with spectacular views of the Columbia River. So I encourage you to do that one. There's also the Seattle to Portland STP ride coming up on July 14th and 15th. If you're in reasonable shape and can get some training in, it's not too late to join that ride. It's a rolling party. I've done it myself. It's 10,000 of your friends riding from Seattle to Portland. It's supported. There's food. There's water. There me there's mechanics along the way. It's a lot of fun. There's also the Sunday Parkways. That's going on right now, offered by the City of Portland. They usually have one a month in different parks throughout the city, and they shut down the streets. And you can take your kids and ride and enjoy the different food booths and arts and crafts. That's really fun. City of Portland offers some fun evening rides, uh, including Ride to Selwood, Lentz Green Ring. Um, there's a Ride to the Roses, Parks and Greens. So go to portlandoregon.gov or Portland by Cycle. Uh, I'm doing one this weekend. It's the Columbia County Cruiser out of St. Helens. Uh, there's either a 60 or a 100 mile option. Again, roads with very little traffic. Just some great cycling events to set out for yourself as attainable rides, and you can use organizations like the Portland Wheelmen to get you trained up so you can do those rides. They have a ride every day of the year. So I want to introduce our second guest, Maddie Carlson. She is a columnist at bikeportland.org and also an author. She authored Urban Cycling, How to Get to Work, Save Money, and Use Your Bike for City Living. Welcome to Psychology Today, Maddie, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me on. You're probably more accustomed to being the interviewer and not the interviewee, <laughs> right? It's a little less scary <laughs> that way. <laughs> so it looks like you moved here from Seattle. Tell us your impression about the Portland cycling scene and some of your cycling passions and peeves. I love the bike culture in Portland. Um, it's just amazing here, uh, especially right now is June. So we're having our first pedal palooza. We've only been down here 10 months. So we haven't lived here through June yet. Um, Pedal Palooza is a month long festival and it's mostly crowdsourced. Volunteers just list rides. I've led two already. Um, and I could add more to the calendar through the rest of June if I wanted to. <laughs> um, the, I went to a little bit of the kickoff ride which had thousands of people on it. Um, I want to take my kids to one of the bigger rides too just so they can experience um, you know, something unlike they've never seen. Thousands of people swirling around on bikes around them. Um, but beyond that, there are groups, I think, for every single person. One of the groups I'm involved in as the co-director is Kittical Mass, PDX. 
Um, that's critical mass with a K. It's a, a play on words of critical mass, and it's just a fun parade of families on bikes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a global movement, so P Portland isn't the only city with one. It actually started in Eugene in 2008, um, and then very conveniently in Seattle in 2009, where I lived at the time, so I got involved with it there, mm. and then it moved to Portland, or you know, it, it added to Portland in 2010, so it's been going along here for a while. Um, we moved here, and I helped lead, start leading rides for it. Um, so that's a fun family one. And there's, um, I don't know how many different groups for women um, and women identifying writers here in Portland, more than anywhere else that I know. Mm. Um, so I, I feel like there's really something for everyone, and I love that about Portland. I remember, the pet, what I remember about Petopalooza is the guys on the really tall bikes, mm -hmm. and the kids love to see that. It's like, how did they get up there, Mom? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have one at home, but I oh cheat. I do? climb up from my fence. <laughs> 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 Not that you have to have freak bikes if you live in Portland, but I feel like, you know, more of a Portlander. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it gives that. it such a circus <laughs> kind of fun atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And once that. you're up there, it feels just like a bike. <laughs> really? I'll have to try that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should have brought it. So tell me what drew you to cycling and what kind of riding you're doing right now. Um, I like to say that it's in my blood. My mother was born in the Netherlands, one of the most bikey uh, countries in the world. Mm -hmm. um, she was the only one to leave um, for America from the Netherlands. So we'd go back, you know, every couple summers and I'd spend a couple weeks on a clunky rental bike, you know, just living life on a bike and getting used to getting everywhere by bike. Um, and it was amazing and wonderful. And then my cousins started having babies and putting them in cute little baby seats on the fronts of their bikes and the backs of their bikes. And I just knew when I have babies someday in the future, I'm gonna do this too. Mm. So um, I just knew I would do that. And that's how a lot of people fall into family biking. They're either in the, the um, like the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam or Copenhagen, you know, in Denmark, and they see family biking and they wanna bring that home with them. Um, or you have relatives and you see it. Nowadays, you can see someone like me on the street um, you know, at home and, and want to replicate that. But um, before family biking was so prevalent, um, you had to leave the country to see it and want to, you know, do that too because it is awfully fun. Right. Uh, so that's how I got started. And most of my biking is just biking for transportation. We don't have a car, so if we want to go somewhere, um, we bike. And it makes everything so much more fun mm. um, and easy. Uh, I do, I mean, I like all kinds of biking. Biking for transportation has made me like other kinds of biking. Um, I have a mountain bike that, you know, sat collecting dust for 10 years. Um, <laughs> but like now I'm biking distance from Gateway Green, the in-town mountain bike park. Um, I, you know, I just like doing the single track, but if I'm on my way to Ikea, I'll cut through and, you know, mountain bike on my way there. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. The kids love it there. So there's a new mountain bike park that I've heard about, but I haven't. It's off of, off of 82nd and Southeast Portland. Is that what you're talking um, about? I, I think that's probably the one you're thinking of um, okay. in the Gateway area. I think it's yes, Northeast up there. It's fairly close to the Lumberyard, which is an indoor mountain right. bike park. Yes, that's the so one I'm thinking of. I yeah, that it's, it's an amazing place. Um, I've been out to Sandy Ridge. I've done that mountain bike loop. Yeah, but see, this makes me want to try a little more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just a, a very slow single track rider, and it's kind of nice when no one else is there in the middle of the day, you know, on the way to Ikea, <laughs> when okay. I don't have to worry about getting in anyone's way. Okay. But it's great. And there are jumps for the kids and a, a pump track. and. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Are you comfortable telling how old your kids are? Yeah, they're 8 and 11, um, okay. and, and it's nice. They mostly ride their own bikes these days. I have a cargo bike, um, and I take that usually just in case one of them gets tired or grumpy or, you know, hurts himself and wants me to carry him in his bike. So a cargo bike is designed to carry more than, a lot more than just the rider. Um, mine is a long tail style cargo bike, so it's about a foot longer than a regular bike behind. Um, there are also bikes where it's like a wheelbarrow in front of you where you put all the cargo in front. But long tails are really convenient for putting kids on top of the deck behind me as well as pulling their bikes along behind. Right. So I can I can carry both kids and both bikes, but they're kind of heavy now <laughs> at 8 and 11. So <laughs> I like carrying just one. It kind of cuts down the, the extra bodies running around <laughs> me. But for the most part, they ride their own bikes, and, and I try to keep up with them. <laughs> About what age did they decide, okay, we want to ride our own bikes, Mom? You know, we eased in it to, to it really slowly. Um, mm. And it, it, the nice thing with a cargo bike is I could carry them to somewhere flat enough and safe enough for them to feel comfortable riding on their own. So okay. we could, you know, go down two steep hills and across a busy street to the multi-use path right by our old house, and then I'd let them ride. Mm. And, you know, unfortunately, that meant on the way home, I'd have to carry them up those two steep hills. Right. Um, so now we're in a flat neighborhood, so <laughs> that's a lot that nicer. a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I'm very inspired by you that you're traveling without a car and doing everything by bike with an eight-year-old and 11-year-old. That's super inspiring. Yeah, Portland is a awfully an easy city to do that in, so okay. there is that. Um, but that, that's the thing about any urban kind of city. Um, my, you know, my book is about using a bike for city living because you have transit options and everything's close by and hopefully, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's good bike infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is, I know people who live without cars in suburban areas and it's, it's a different beast when you're, you're out and things are separated by very busy roads and long distances. Right. So not unlike our first guest, Andrew Shock Hitch, you've been involved in promoting bicycling as a mean, bicycling as a means for moving towards sustainable lifestyles and communities. So can you share some of your observations and beliefs in that regard? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I love living without a car. Um, and I feel that, you know, inspiring more people to ride bikes more, even, you know, one more trip than they are doing already, is what it's going to take to make everything more sustainable. Um, there's just not room for everyone to drive. Every time someone complains about traffic, you know, mm -hmm. that's a sign. They're, the problem is that there, you know, there are too many cars all at the same time. So if we could replace even one of those trips with a bike trip, and I try to demonstrate uh, the fun side of it. And, you know, it's fun to bike around with kids. Mm -hmm. um, I so the school got out last week, so they came to the grocery store with me. Yeah, um, which you know would not have been fun in the car, but you know, on our bikes, we we found a new route over there. Um, we live in the Woodstock neighborhood, one of Portland's many neighborhoods with a lot of unimproved roadways, um, mm -hmm. which means gravel streets. And we utilize those to get around our neighborhood because no cars drive on them because mm -hmm. they're horribly bumpy, but they're really fun to <laughs> you know ride slowly on a bike. Right. So we found some new gravel roads and that was really fun. We found um, an abandoned like beach toy in the middle of the street and the kids picked it up and celebrated for a minute where <laughs> before I told them like, why don't you choose which house you think that came from and we'll put it on the sidewalk mm -hmm. in front of that. <laughs> so just like little things like that and stopping to like watch squirrels chasing each other. You can't do that as easily in a car. Um, you can do that walking, but you know, walking right. takes a very long time to <laughs> go two miles to the grocery store and then you can't come home with six bags of groceries. So do no. you take the cargo bike to carry the groceries? Yeah, then? I take the cargo bike. So yeah. they don't have to carry the groceries, mom carries them. Oh, so yeah, that's the thing. They don't carry anything yet. Okay. <laughs> their little bikes have racks and I have panniers for them and okay. I, I have high hopes that someday they'll do all the carrying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so far I do <laughs> all the carrying. <laughs> In one of your recent columns, you actually reached out to parents asking, why don't you bike with your young children? So I wondered what prompted the question and what were some of the common threads? So that is part of an effort to shed my rose-colored glasses when I, I look at Portland. Um, not that Seattle was a bad city for biking around in as a family, but it's just so much better here. There are so many more um, greenways and protected bike lanes and just bike lanes in general. Um, and it's also flatter, but not, not that that's part of this, but I know one of the reasons just that people in general don't bike more is they don't have access to a working bike. Um, that's long been, uh, you know, known to be um, a barrier to mm -hmm. cycling in general. So I figured the same held true for family bikers. I thought when I asked that question, everyone was going to say they couldn't decide yet which bike they wanted and I could provide some information about that or they couldn't afford one, but they were saving up. But mm. everyone said it was because they didn't feel safe out there. And oh. I feel silly that I was so surprised by that. And I, I mean, I do realize that Portland is by no means an all ages and abilities cycling city like a lot of um, European cities are. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel safe with my kids riding just anywhere. And I choose all of our routes very, very carefully. Um, but I didn't realize that it was such a deterrent for a lot of families. Can you share some of your own experiences and advice on family writing? Um, yeah, con connecting to the community I think helps a lot of people um, a tremendous amount. Uh, I'm on Facebook and there's a great group called PDX Cargo Bike Gang mm. and we, we share stories and route advice. I don't really go anywhere new without asking someone for route advice oh. just, just to be safe mm -hmm. or just to you know, know someone's favorite route. Um, a nice thing is family bikers always know the flattest way to get anywhere because we mm -hmm. have very, very heavy bikes mm -hmm. or kids on s heavy single speed bikes. Okay. Um, so it's in all of our best interests to know the flattest, safest routes around. Mm -hmm. um, th I mean, that's a big way of, you know, feeling comfortable, just having a, a safe feeling route, just knowing you'll have a stoplight to cross an arterial rather than have to wait and wait and wait. Mm -hmm. um, so that's nice, having community to share route advice. Um, and just getting out there, like Kittical Mass is a wonderful way to do a group ride. There's a whole safety and numbers aspect. Mm -hmm. um, Kittical Mass, 
likes to make sure we're in the street being seen. The motto is kids are traffic too. So we don't stick to bike trails and in parks. We want to be out there. Um, we want to be in bike lanes, on arterials, on greenways, a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, so it, it's both practicing our safety skills and doing it in the safety of a big group and getting more confident just by building time in the saddle. That sounds really fun to me. Yeah, <laughs> at so two miles an hour sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> I should add. Well, it's just doing something <laughs> with your kids where you're outdoors and you're exercising and they're getting that excess energy out. It yes. just sounds really fun. Uh, anyway, you wrote Urban Cycling, How to Get to Work, Save Money, and Use Your Bike for City Living. City Living, sorry. Many would-be commuters are interested but concerned, like we've just been talking mm -hmm. about, with fears about traffic or uncertainty about how to get started. So let's spend a few minutes discussing some of those fears and alleviating them. Well, um, for one thing, a lot of people who've been driving to work and want to switch to bike commuting are going to, you know, look at it through their windshield and think this is exactly where I have to go with my bike. Whereas, for the most part, you're not going to be using the same streets. It's, it's very rare that there's only one way to get from home to work. Mm -hmm. um, and odds are you're not going to use any of the same streets on a bike. Um, but, you know, without a little bit of looking at a map or finding a buddy at, at work to show you the way, that, that's a wonderful uh, thing to do. There are a lot of bike mentors out there. Mm -hmm. um, some workplaces have programs or you just ask someone. Um, other barriers for getting around can be rail railroads, you know, if they cut through the city or a river and you have to choose bridges and, mm -hmm. you know, I'll go out of my way to go over Tillicum Crossing because it's my favorite bridge. Mm -hmm. I like the steel bridge too. If I'm in a hurry, I'll use another bridge, but um, I'm usually not in a hurry so I can take a pleasant route to get places and I really think it's worth it for a commute. Just coming over here today, I saw I could have gotten here in 10 minutes just going on the road, but I haven't been over here before, so I decided to take the trail through the, the Waterhouse uh, Vertical Park, and mm -hmm. it's really, really nice. I mm -hmm. really liked it. Um, you know, you can't go fast on it because it's really weavy and there are people walking, and those are the kind of places I like riding, and I'd rather take an extra five minutes mm -hmm. and do something like that, and I think a lot of bike commuters would feel safer that way, too. Oh, I will take the long way every yeah. time <laughs> over riding with traffic. Right, right. And I like the Hawthorne Bridge, too. I like that one okay. It's... Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't like my kids. See, it's a little different when I think about my kids I next see, to yeah. that so curve. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. couldn't they just put a tiny little fence there? <laughs> it would I got gotcha. it feel so different. I feel you. I, I don't <laughs> ride a lot of places without envisioning what it would be like if my kids were riding with me. So I'll ride it alone for sure. But with my kids, I, I, mean, I probably would ride it, but I'd be much more likely to choose a different bridge just for that reason. I think when I started bike commuting, I took a weekend to do it before I did it for a real work day. Yeah, yeah, both to check mm -hmm. the timing. There are some people who get out there and they discover they got to work really, really early. Um, that's usually <laughs> not the case. It's probably going to take longer than you think. So yeah, if you could practice during a quiet time, mm -hmm. or maybe the very first time you do it for work, if you can come in late that day or incredibly early that day, so you don't have to deal with like the press of traffic. Yeah. Um, is a nice way to do it, but yeah. And that's the thing, practice makes perfect and everything you right. do more times is gonna get easier and easier. I agree. So women seem to be a minority in the cycling world. What do they need and how can we help them? I think it's kind of the same as family bikers, finding community both in person and online. And again, Portland is a wonderful city for that. Um, on Bike Portland, there was an article about the many thriving um, women's bike clubs and I think there were at least 10 of them in it. Mm -hmm. um, the Street Trust has a group called Women Bike, um, and it's both online with you where you can ask questions and you can connect with one of their role models who are bike mentors and like welcome questions. Mm -hmm. And they have meetups and they have rides. I rode with a group um, when we just moved here to Oregon City along the trolley trail. And it's, it's a little hard to navigate that trail, so it was really nice having someone lead the way. And mm -hmm. um, I want to do that with the kids now, now that they're out of school and we can take our time doing it because it's mm -hmm. flat enough and it's, it's a decent distance, but not too far. And I think it'll be a really fun uh, way to spend the day. And I don't know that I would have thought to do it if I hadn't had the practice and the safety of the group like that. Um, so that's a group that's um, out there and touches a lot of people and it's just one of many. And that, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. I've done the East Bank Esplanade, taken it all the way to the Selwood, and then come down and got on that trail mm -hmm. past the Milwaukee Riverfront Park. In fact, I just did yeah. that this morning, went on the trolley trail 
all the way down to Roques, which is my favorite hot dog place. Then you turn around and go back, and it's pretty much all bike trail. Yeah, I'm and the roads that you are on, <laughs> like Umatilla. It's like there's no traffic. Yeah, I love rides like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's so fun. Uh, it's fun to go with any group, um, but yeah, especially kids. But anyone can appreciate that. Yeah. There are lots of women, female-only rides, if that's what you're into. Yeah. There's Ride Like a Girl. I've heard about them. Yeah, there's they a actually Portland. actually teach you. Mm -hmm. There's a Portland chapter of Black Girls Do Bike. Um, Friends on Bikes is for um, women, trans, femme, non-gender, um, binary women of color. Uh, so, like, the, the possibilities are endless. They and are. There are clinics for bike camping and, yeah, you, you name it. I feel like Portland has it more than anyone else. I want to talk a little bit about cyclocross because the season's coming up here and I'm not sure if people are familiar with that and I know that you used to race cyclocross. Yeah, cyclocross is really fun um, and there are a lot of, uh, there should be a lot of clinics coming up. I, I never really figured out how to balance um, motherhood and training for cyclocross races, but even if you're out of condition, it's a really fun sport. Um, they're really fun to watch just to begin with. Um, and there are a couple, at least two um, women-only cyclocross teams in, in Portland. And um, they do compete, but I would say they're probably more fun than competitive. Um, and anyone can join. Uh, Gladys Bikes is a very women-friendly bike shop on Alberta. And they have the Gladiators. Um, and I know Sorella Forte. I don't, I don't want to cut you off, Maddie, but we obviously didn't have enough time to talk because oh. I'm being told <laughs> that we have to wrap it up. OK. I'm so sad. <laughs> we have to have you come back and talk some more. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, it's been really great. So do we have time for any more questions? I just want to remind everybody that um, there's lots of rides out there as you've been hearing us talk and to be safe and get a bike and look into it. We talked about some of them earlier. I don't know, I guess we can keep talking until they tell me I can't. <laughs> so there's some great cycling events out there. Remember we talked about STP, Friends of the Columbia Gorge Highway, the Gorge Ride, 